Six, the witch mother. Husband, listen to me. Tomorrow at daybreak, we'll take the children out to the thickest part of the forest. They'll never find the way home again, and that way we'll be rid of them. Hansel and Gretel. Telling my fears to my mother is like feeding flies to a spider. She savors digesting them. Nothing satisfies her more than knowing how to scare me. Therapists hear horrifying stories of child abuse that never make the headlines. The media seem drawn to stories about children who die, as if the suffering of those who survive is any less terrifying. Children of witch mothers never outgrow their fear. Although Amy, a 50-year-old patient, survived being raised by a borderline witch, she described the mind-numbing terror. After all these years, I still tense up when my 80-year-old mother sits too close to me. My breathing becomes shallow as I focus intently on her breathing. I can't make it obvious that I'm waiting to be attacked. My muscles ache from the tension of holding myself still. When I finally have a chance to move away from her, I relax. Being trapped in a car with her is the worst. I have to be able to get away. Some children may not survive simply because they are too young to get away. On a warm fall night in 1994, Susan Smith, a separated mother of two, strapped her toddlers in their car seats and took them for a ride. Moments later, her three-year-old son Michael started to cry. His mother was driving erratically, sobbing, and biting her nails. Michael's 14-month-old brother Alex must have realized that something was wrong. By the time a baby is seven months old, he is capable of sensing his mother's mood. Children of borderlines know when the good mother has turned into the witch. Susan Smith drove to a lake near Union, South Carolina, and parked her car at the top of a boat ramp. She stepped out of the car, released the parking brake, and let her car roll into the water with her babies strapped inside. Covering her ears with her hands so she could not hear their screams, she ran up the ramp as the car rolled toward the lake. It took six minutes for the car to sink, drifting away from the ramp, bobbing nose first into the water. David Smith, the father of Alex and Michael, recollected. There were some troubling things that I learned in the aftermath of the killings. There was only one conclusion I could make. Susan had watched the car as it sank. This was too awful, too terrible to imagine. Susan waiting, seeing Michael and Alex die. If that were true, there was no doubt of something truly evil in Susan's character, something unspeakable. The nation believed her initial claim that the children had been victims of a carjacking. She pleaded with the kidnapper on national television to return her children to safety. Nine days later, when she confessed to drowning the children, public sympathy turned to outrage. Susan Smith sacrificed her children in order not to be abandoned by her boyfriend, the wealthy heir to the town's largest industry. He wrote a letter to Susan explaining that he was not interested in dating a woman with children, and so she disposed of them. Television viewers, confused by home videos of this young mother playing with her two small children, were dumbfounded. She seemed so normal. How was it possible? Two lessons can be learned from the Susan Smith case. The first is that a borderline's fear of abandonment can lead to tragically desperate acts. The second is that failing to recognize the borderline witch can have deadly consequences. Family, friends, and healthcare professionals must learn to recognize the symptoms of BPD, insist on treatment, or continue to pay the high price of ignorance. Obviously, most borderline mothers do not kill their children. Most borderline mothers do not physically abuse their children. But the witch's children live in terror of her power. The look in her eyes strikes fear in their hearts. Words alone can shatter their souls. The mother's heartbeat is the first sound a child hears. Devices that imitate the steady beat of a mother's heart are marketed to calm newborn babies. Infants are intimately familiar with the sound of their mother's voice and the rhythm of her breathing. When her heart turns cold and her breathing becomes shallow, the witch's children freeze with fear. Anything is possible when the witch emerges. On May 19, 1983, 
Diane Downs drove her three children to a secluded road, took a rifle out of the trunk, and shot them as they sat helplessly in the car. Seven-year-old Cheryl died instantly, but nine-year-old Christy and her three-year-old brother miraculously survived. Months of physical therapy, speech therapy, and psychotherapy enabled Christy to testify that her mother had shot her and her siblings. Nine-year-old Christy Down speaks for all children of borderline witches when she asked, Why didn't anybody hear us screaming? We were screaming and screaming. Across most species, the cries of the young are psychologically designed to trigger a mother's protective response. Their screams are designed to pierce the mother's heart and bring her running. A human mother can recognize the distinctive sound of her child's cry by its third day of life. Yet Diane Downs aimed a gun at her screaming children and pulled the trigger anyway. Children are the first to recognize and the last to admit that something is wrong with their mother. Yet the public's response to Christina Crawford's autobiography illustrates how readily others disbelieve even adult children. In her subsequent book, Survivor, Christina wrote, It never dawned on me that instead of being believed, a nightmare would be in store for me, for my sense of self was rocked once again with the publication of my book, Mommy Dearest. Never did I imagine it would ignite years of soul-shattering controversy that would threaten my life and my sanity. Christina believed that her near-fatal stroke resulted from personal vilification following the publication of Mommy Dearest. The voices of children are easily silenced by the fear of not being believed. If three-year-old Michael Smith had somehow miraculously survived, would he have told anyone that his mother tried to drown him? Would anyone have believed him? No one wants to believe that a mother would sacrifice her own child, especially the child. Louise Kaplan writes that normally, the mother's presence is like a fixed light that gives the child the security to move out safely to explore the world and then return safely to harbor. The witch's children have no safe harbor. Because the witch emerges when the mother and child are alone, no witnesses can verify the child's experience. The witch's children feel like prisoners of a secret war. By the time they grow up, they often unconsciously repress their memories, and their terror may be transformed into hatred. The witch's grown son may become a sadistic serial killer, able to have intercourse only with dead women who cannot reject or humiliate him. Children of borderline witches know that their mother can make people vanish. They have seen her cut people to shreds with words, shatter the reputations of those who betray her, and stab them in the heart with false accusations. They know the feeling of sinking into nothingness by soul-wrenching verbal attacks. Alex and Michael Smith sank into the darkness, knowing what all children of borderline witches know, that their own mother sacrificed them to save herself. Recognizing the borderline witch requires more than a superficial glance at her external character. In 1994, Susan Smith duped an entire nation. The search for her children cost taxpayers more than $2 million and broke the hearts of millions of people. In his book, Beyond All Reason, her appalled husband claimed that she did not seem genuinely sorry. David Smith wrote, When I thought back over the visit, what struck me most was that she didn't seem really sorry, despite saying she was again and again. If the roles were reversed, I would have been stretched out on the floor, wrapped around her ankles, bawling my head off that I was sorry, wailing for forgiveness. It was like her written confession. If you read it, you see, she doesn't talk much about the boys. She says she's sorry a few times and that's it. Mostly it's about Susan, how Susan feels. Understanding the feelings of the borderline witch is critical to determining the risk to her children. Those closest to the witch often minimize, deny, and ignore signs of her desperation until tragedy strikes. Although denial may be useful in avoiding unpleasant emotion, it also prevents intervention and thus can have deadly consequences. After her arrest, Susan Smith wrote to her husband complaining that, Nobody gives a damn about me. David Smith stated, I couldn't believe it. The letter shocked me. 
It made me think that Susan didn't have a firm grasp of reality. I thought to myself, what kind of person would write a letter like this after she killed her kids? Median Mothers The Median Mother is the most pathological type of borderline witch. Although she can emerge from any one of the other three types of borderline mothers, most witches are not Median Mothers. Median Mothers are extremely rare. In 431 BC, Euripides, the Greek playwright, wrote a compelling drama about a mother who murdered her two sons to punish her unfaithful husband. Centuries later, when the play was performed on Broadway in 1947, one critic claimed that while it was believable that a discarded wife might dispose of her blonde successor by any means in her power, the ensuing infanticide is too much. Yet the play Medea survives as the epic story of the murderous mother because of its inherent truth the disturbing reality that rejection, in Medea's case by he who was all the world to me, can drive some women to infanticide. Like Medea, Susan Smith justified murdering her children because she felt that life had been unfair to her. Medea convinces herself, for one short day forget your children, afterwards weep. Though you kill them, they were your beloved sons. Life has been cruel to me. Susan Smith wrote, Why was everything so bad in my life? I dropped to the lowest when I allowed my children to go down that ramp into the water. Adler explains that borderlines continually fight to manage separation anxiety and are forced to rely on others for enough sense of holding, soothing, to keep separation anxiety in check, to avoid annihilation panic. Rejection triggers the desperate fear of sinking into the cold, dark abyss of abandonment, a fate the witch feels is worse than death. Murder, therefore, becomes an option. Her terrified children sense her desperate determination and horrifying reversal of the protective instinct of maternal love. Convicted murderer Diane Downs obtained copies of photos taken at her daughter's autopsy. She insisted on showing the gruesome images to fellow inmates as if to say, look what I can do. A televised interview captured her sinister expression when the nauseated reporter interrupted Down's all-too-graphic description of the bloody car. It was a smile, but such a strange smile. Her eyes narrowed, her lips in a smirk. The need for power and control over others the need to elicit a response of fear and shock is a source of pride for borderline witches. Terrified and powerless as children, witch mothers project repressed rage and terror onto others. Their sense of self-importance may be primarily derived from their ability to elicit fear, and their pride may be thinly concealed. Most witch mothers do not physically sacrifice their children. Emotional sacrifice is much more common. For example, a witch mother who discovers that her husband has sexually molested her daughter may punish the daughter by sending her away. Indirectly, these mothers punish the husband by taking away the object of his desire. They view the experience in terms of how they were hurt, rather than recognizing the child's trauma. A pseudo-self-righteousness or a justification based on religious dogma may conceal their lack of true remorse. They may cling to the belief that they are forgiven and believe that they have spared their children from further suffering. Susan Smith's chilling words reveal the twisted perspective. My children, Michael and Alex, are with our Heavenly Father now, and I know that they will never be hurt again. As a mom, that means more than words could ever say. A witch mother can be insanely jealous of her daughter, may not be able to tolerate displays of affection between her daughter and husband, and may accuse the father of incest. A patient explained that whenever her mother witnessed her father playing with her, her mother flew into a rage and accused the father of being sick. The patient, confused by her mother's reaction, assumed that she had done something wrong. The patient felt guilty about loving her father, complicating the resolution of the Oedipal complex. The witch mother may be unable to tolerate such displays of affection because she feels left out and abandoned. Such mothers may say to themselves, he never plays with me like that. We never have that kind of fun together. He is my husband. I should come first. 
there's something wrong with him. Jealous rage can lead to murderous rage toward the child. Guilt does not deter the Medean mother because she feels justified in her actions. Medea convinces herself, yes, I can endure guilt, however horrible, the laughter of my enemies I will not endure. When Diane Downs walked into the state penitentiary, she wore skin-tight Levi's so tight that every mound, cleft, and tuck was accentuated. Her jeans were tucked into the wildest pair of boots, shiny black leather with six-inch spiked heels. Yes, the prisoners in the state penitentiary would remember Diane Downs' arrival. She looked mean, she looked bad, and she looked sexy. She did not look like a grieving mother. The Medean mother may sacrifice her children, but never, ever her pride. The Witch's Emotional State, Annihilating Rage But the old woman had only pretended to be so kind. Actually, she was a wicked witch who waylaid children and had built her house out of bread to entice them. Hansel and Gretel In his book, The Gift of Fear, Gavin de Becker warns, we must learn and then teach our children that niceness does not equal goodness. People seeking to control others almost always present the image of a nice person in the beginning. Clarnell Kemper was apparently a well-liked and competent administrative assistant at the University of Southern California. Her co-workers apparently never detected the witch within. The witch in the workplace can function effectively unless she is threatened or cornered. Cheney described Mr. Kemper's experience living with his ex-wife. Suicide missions in wartime and later atomic bomb testings were nothing compared to living with his wife, Clarnell. Mr. Kemper recalled that she affected me as a grown man more than 396 days and nights of fighting on the front did. I became confused and was not certain of anything for quite a time. Clarnell Kemper was a large, loud-spoken woman who bore a son and two daughters. When her son Edmund was nine years old, she and her husband divorced. A year later, Edmund's father discovered to his horror that Clarnell kept Edmund trapped in the cellar at night. Edmund was terrified because the only way out was a door that was blocked by the kitchen table. The darkness within the borderline witch is annihilating rage. All mothers lose their temper, but ordinary mothers do not turn on their children, set traps, ridicule, humiliate, or enjoy watching them suffer. Ordinary mothers would sacrifice their lives to save their children. In contrast, the borderline witch sacrifices her child to save herself. Lashkar observes that borderlines will frequently sacrifice themselves, their family, or their children. In court custody cases, children become the sacrificial objects, are placed in the middle of arguments, and are deprived, made to be go-betweens, and treated as little adults playing the role of mediators, therapists, and saviors. Few borderline mothers are always witches, and some are never witches. The child's perception defines the borderline witch. The witch who hides in the waif, the hermit, and the queen appears only to those who trigger her rage. She represents an ego state that can be triggered by criticism, betrayal, or abandonment. The witch is therefore deceiving in appearance and manner. Like a cat with a mouse, she may lie in wait, pouncing when the child least expects it, deceiving the child into believing that she is no longer angry and then unleashing her rage. Each witch has her own unique pattern of behavior that reflects her early experience and the nature of her relationship with the particular child. The borderline mother who primarily appears as a witch is filled with self-hatred as the result of surviving a childhood that required complete submission to a hostile or sadistic caregiver. The witch may exhibit antisocial behavior, such as habitual lying, exploitativeness, sexual promiscuity, and physical, sexual, or verbal abuse. Or she can be a cold, snobbish, self-righteous, withholding witch. Either way, she sets up her children to be trapped and deceived in the same way that she was once deceived. She may trick her children to tell her what they want and then deliberately withhold those very things. 
She may force her children into embarrassing and humiliating situations and then ridicule them. She may betray their confidences, share their secrets, and exploit their fears. Her calculated cruelty can take many forms, although she believes that her behavior is justified. Children who dare to resist the witch mother's control face further punishment. Yet witch mothers may corner their children and provoke attack. Children may threaten the witch physically or attempt to ward her off with a knife or other weapon. Usually, however, they turn the weapon on themselves. The threat, don't come any closer or I'll kill myself, may be a desperate child's only recourse. Edmund Kemper recalled, My mother and I started right in on horrendous battles, just horrible battles, violent and vicious. I've never been in such a vicious verbal battle with anyone. It would go to fists with a man, but this was my mother, and I couldn't stand the thought of my mother and I doing these things. She insisted on it, and just over stupid things. I remember one roof razor was over whether I should have my teeth cleaned. Female children are more likely to attack themselves than their mothers. Self-mutilation expresses rage at the self instead of the mother. Male children tend to externalize rage, cutting up small animals instead of their mother. In one case, an adolescent son pulled a knife on his borderline mother and threatened to stab her. At the last minute, however, he turned the knife toward his stomach and stabbed himself. Both male and female children of borderlines are more likely to hurt themselves than their mothers. Young children instinctually protect their mothers physically as well as emotionally. The rage of the borderline witch is as venomous as the bite of a viper. Her words can be difficult to remember because they are so unexpected and degrading. Her tone of voice conveys her sinister intent. As Daniel Goleman explains, Just as the mode of the rational mind is words, the mode of the emotions is nonverbal. Indeed, when a person's words disagree with what is conveyed via his tone of voice, gesture, or other nonverbal channel, the emotional truth is in how he says something rather than in what he says. One rule of thumb used in communication research is that 90% or more of an emotional message is nonverbal. The witch's tone of voice conveys a clear message of venomous hatred. But children of witch mothers are like snake handlers, who, frequently bitten, develop immunity. With time, a thick layer of scar tissue eventually covers the wounds. Author Susanna Kaysen eloquently describes the effect. Scar tissue has no character. It's not like skin. It doesn't show age or illness or pallor or tan. It has no pores, no hair, no wrinkles. It's like a slipcover. It shields and disguises what's beneath. That's why we grow it. We have something to hide. Managing the adrenaline triggered by an attack by one's mother is not easy. Children who fight back are punished. Children who hurt themselves may be labeled as crazy. Children who hurt someone else are referred to the justice system. The witch's children must surrender themselves to her control and suffer the consequences of internalized rage. Child analyst Elizabeth Gilliard treated a seven-year-old boy who demanded that she hit him. She recalled that the child would ask her to beat him, explaining that the only control he felt he possessed was deciding when he was to be beaten. All children need control over their environment in order to feel secure. Because attacks by the witch mother are unexpected and unpredictable, the child experiences massive insecurity. Attacks by the witch mother are like tornadoes, random, devastating, and unpredictable. Naturally, her children are on constant alert for changes in the atmosphere that might indicate when and where she will turn. The Turn one of the most devastating experiences for children of borderlines is the turn. The turn is a sudden attack, the abrupt withdrawal of love and affection, and razor-sharp words that can pierce the heart as painfully as an arrow. The messages aimed at children include, I want you out of my life, I'd be better off without you, and I should never have had you kids. The child might inadvertently trigger the turn by, one, showing affection for someone other than mother, two, disobeying or expressing an independent thought, three, diminishing mother, 
4. Differentiating from mother, or 5. Disagreeing with mother. The disturbing reality is that the turn may be triggered by circumstances that have nothing to do with the child. Any situation that triggers feelings of betrayal, rejection, or abandonment might cause the good mother to turn into the witch. When the borderline mother's partner is absent or frustrating, she may turn on her children. Children have no way of knowing that the borderline's emotional state is primarily determined by the state of her relationship with her own primary attachment figure. They have no way of knowing that their mother sometimes views their existence as a threat to her existence. Thus, the turn seems entirely random to the child. De Becker explains that, as with the shark attack, randomness and lack of warning are the attributes of human violence we fear most. Although De Becker is referring to adults here, children have an even greater need for predictability because they possess so little power. Children who live with a predatory mother become unconsciously preoccupied with reading their mother's moods. A fleeting glance, a furtive gesture, deceleration, and a shift of direction are signals of an approaching turn. Bracing, hiding, or merely holding on gives children a much-needed sense of control. Shutting down, avoiding eye contact, and getting away are other means of establishing control. The witch's children can feel blown away by her rage. Whichever child she chooses to target feels annihilated after the turn. Although a few adult children had mothers who threatened to kill them, the majority recalled episodes of being emotionally discarded or disowned and verbally dehumanized. The disposable child is depersonalized and referred to as that girl or the girl or boy, rather than my daughter or my son. Deliberately avoiding the use of a possessive pronoun or the child's name dehumanizes the child and symbolizes banishment. De Becker points out that for children, banishment equals death. For all social animals, from ants to antelopes, identity is the pass card to inclusion, and inclusion is the key to survival. If a baby loses its identity as the child of its parents, a possible outcome is abandonment. For a human infant, that means death. The turn reverses the mother-child relationship from one of loving acceptance to life-threatening rejection. Masterson quotes a borderline's child as stating that his childhood was like living in a permanent funeral, as if I might soon be buried. The borderline's children are acutely aware of their disposability and, like illegal immigrants, live in fear of sudden exile. The witch attacks her child one minute, later behaving as if nothing out of the ordinary occurred. Blinding rage seems to erase her memory. Kernberg provides one such example. A hospitalized borderline patient literally yelled at her hospital physician during their early half-hour interviews, and her voice carried to all the offices in the building. After approximately two weeks of such behavior, which the hospital physician felt unable to influence by any psychotherapeutic means, he saw her by chance shortly after leaving his office. He was still virtually trembling and was struck by the fact that the patient seemed completely relaxed and smiled in a friendly way while talking to some other patients with whom she was acquainted. If mental health professionals tremble in the wake of borderline rage, how do children survive? Children of borderlines may try everything in their power to hide. Like adults fighting for their lives, they may beg for mercy, try to cajole, cry, or plead, and promise to be good. When the witch goes away, the child is indescribably relieved. But children of witches are acutely attuned to the sound of their mother's voice, an early indicator of the witch's return. When her tone is haughty and cold, they are on full alert. The human brain is designed to focus attention on the greatest threat to survival. Research on individuals who have been victims of violent crimes discovered a phenomenon known as weapon focusing. Witnesses of violent crimes tend to have accurate memories of the weapon, but are unable to remember other details. Children of borderline witches may not remember the details of previous attacks, but are extremely sensitized to indications of imminent attacks. 
They remember changes in her tone of voice, her facial expression, and her body language. Interactions with the borderline witch are devastating and potentially dangerous to both mother and child. Borderline witches have a sadomasochistic character structure and are extremely difficult, if not impossible, to help. The witch, like a cyclone, skips over some children and destroys others, attacking those who are perceived as threatening. Although her attacks can provoke retaliation by the child, the witch believes that retaliation justifies continued abuse. It is a vicious cycle that begins with the mother's projections. Clarnell Kemper's death exemplifies the pathological dynamics that can develop between the witch and the child who is the target of her rage. Edmund Kemper murdered his mother while she was sleeping. He slashed her throat, decapitated her, and performed intercourse with her dead body. He later cut out her larynx and threw it down the garbage disposal, in that way getting back at her for all the bitter things she had said to him over the years. The sadistic elements of Kemper's relationship with her son were replicated in the manner in which Edmund killed her, exploitation of her vulnerability, post-mortem degradation, and annihilatory rage. The witch's inner experience, self-loathing, and the conviction of being evil. Witches have red eyes and can't see very far, but they have a keen sense of smell like animals so they know when humans are coming. Hansel and Gretel Witch mothers possess a laser-like ability to detect areas of vulnerability in others. Like the witch in Hansel and Gretel, the borderline witch has a keen sense of smell for human weakness. Witch mothers know what to say to hurt or scare their children and use humiliation and degradation to punish them. The witch can be bitter, demanding, sarcastic, and cruel to the child who is the target of her rage. Other children may not perceive her as a witch if they do not possess qualities that trigger her rage. Witches may make statements such as, I'm going to kill you, I'm going to make your life a living hell, or you are never going to hear the end of this. The sinister, sadistic message is a wish for total destruction of the child. When the child is an adult, the roles may be reversed, placing the mother's life in danger. Edmund Kemper was eventually convicted of eight counts of murder, including the death of his own mother. Murdering his mother, he explained, was something he had to do. Someone just standing off to the side isn't really going to see any kind of sense or rhyme or reason. Of the four profiles of BPD in women, the witch is the least likely to seek treatment. Her conviction of being evil and her self-loathing prevent the witch from being able to trust a therapist. She fears being trapped and is likely to become violent if hospitalized. The witch may attack and provoke the therapist in order to evoke punishment or rejection. She is motivated by such powerful destructive urges that she seems unable to tolerate being helped. She lacks belief in her own basic goodness and the ability to perceive goodness in others, even her own children. Masterson contends that some borderlines want to get back, not to get better. The borderline witch is not interested in being helped. She wants revenge. Witch mothers may seek treatment for their children, but never for themselves. They denigrate the mental health profession because they fear its power. The witch's greatest fear is of having no control, of being locked up. Borderline witches are extremely threatened by mental health professionals and have been known to break objects, damage personal belongings, hit, bite, and become physically combative. They may try to destroy those who try to help them. A witch mother who brought her son for treatment registered a complaint with the therapist's professional organization, demanding that the therapist's license be revoked after the therapist recommended that the mother seek treatment. Although the complaint was dismissed, the mother's destructive intent was clear. Witch mothers are more likely to bring their children for treatment than to seek help for themselves. They project their own pathology onto their child and often expect the child to be institutionalized. Because the no-good child is the target of the witch's projections of self-hatred, the mother may wish for the child to be sent away. She needs and wants to get rid of this hated part of herself. Working with children of witch mothers requires careful consideration 
as therapists need to take appropriate steps to protect themselves while acting in the best interests of the child. No one should underestimate the vindictiveness of the borderline witch, but, most important, no one should leave her children unprotected. Characteristics of the Witch Mother Is sadistically controlling and punitive with her children. Ernest Wolfe explains that merger-hungry personalities need to control others completely. The borderline witch's merger-hungry personality leaves her children feeling devoured, suffocated, oppressed, and imprisoned. Even as adults, her children may dream about prison camps, holocausts, invasions, wars, and natural disasters. They fear for their survival. The witch needs complete control over her children and may be abusive with the child who is the target of her rage. Unlike the other three profiles of BPD in women, the witch's behavior evokes submission and fear rather than compassion and concern from others. Her children are forced to submit to her control and may be victims of sadistic emotional, physical, or sexual abuse. Female children of witch mothers may perpetuate the cycle and, as adults, become witch mothers themselves. When young children are deliberately hurt by their mothers, their first instinct is to repress recognition of their mothers as the source of their pain. A toddler whose mother slapped him across the face looked at his mother and exclaimed, Somebody hit me! The young child needs to preserve the image of mother as good in order to survive psychologically. The child concludes, therefore, that he deserved to be hurt. Physical, sexual, or verbal abuse delivers the message, you are bad, quite clearly and convincingly to a child. Children who are victims of chronic abuse may eventually confuse love with hate. Edmund Kemper described this confusion. I had this love-hate complex with my mother that was very hard for me to handle, and I was very withdrawn, withdrawn from reality because of it. I couldn't handle the hate, and the love was actually forced upon me. Such a child expects to be hurt by the person he loves. Kernberg suggests that the anxiety of expecting to be hurt is intolerable. Therefore, the child must have complete control of the one he loves in order to avoid being hurt. In Edmund Kemper's case, as with many serial killers of females, his fear of rejection was so overwhelming that it was impossible for him to have a relationship with a living woman. He fantasized about relationships with his dead victims, kept some of their personal belongings, and talked to their decapitated heads. Male children of witch mothers may grow up to become criminals or sex offenders. One such example was Henry Lee Lucas. Those who knew Henry Lee's mother literally referred to her as a witch. Lucas murdered hundreds of women, including his mother and girlfriend. Viola Lucas beat Henry with broom handles, sticks, and pieces of timber, demanding that he not cry. After beatings, she would explain that she had done it for his own good, that he was born evil. She often told him that he would die in prison. His teachers observed frequent bruises and injuries, but felt powerless to intervene. Possesses Annihilatory Rage Adler states that borderline rage can be annihilatory in intent and intensity. He explains that recognition memory rage is a level of rage so intense that the borderline is momentarily unable to recognize the person who is the target of her anger. The person is no longer recognized as human. Adler describes a patient who stated that she was so angry with him that she stomped him out of her mind. When children are stomped out of their mother's mind, they feel as though they have dropped off the edge of the earth, off the protective radar screen of the mother's mind, and into the abyss. Children can be physically abandoned without feeling annihilated if they trust in their mother's love. Trusting the consistency of their mother's love is unimaginable for the witch's children. Victims of annihilating rage describe feeling blown away. The borderline witch annihilates others so that they no longer exist in her mind. The child who is the target of the borderline's rage represents some hated aspect of the borderline that she wishes to destroy. 
Unfortunately, because the target child is abused, the child develops a self-concept grounded in hatred and behaves in a way that reinforces the mother's perception. Organizes a campaign of denigration. The borderline witch enlists others as allies against the person who is the target of her rage. She may seek out friends, family members, including siblings and children, and co-workers of her victim in whom to confide fabricated stories designed to discredit her enemy. She intentionally leaves out discussion of her own behavior, presenting the other person's behavior as entirely unjustified. A patient recalled that during her childhood, her witch mother frequently phoned her father to complain about the patient's misbehavior. Overhearing these conversations, the patient was infuriated to hear her mother's distorted account. Her mother began haranguing her father with, She's up to it again. She's out of control, yelling and screaming. You've got to do something about her when you get home. The patient was amazed and disgusted at her mother's deceptiveness. Others may believe the witch's allegations of mistreatment because of the intensity of her emotion. Misinformation is calculated and constructed in order to destroy the victim's reputation. Those who do not know the true situation may not notice inconsistencies in the witch's story. It is difficult to verify the truth because the intensity of the witch's emotion dissuades others from asking for details. Kemper's sisters apparently joined their mother in denigrating Edmund. Cheney wrote that Kemper's older sister, Susan, may have emulated her mother's sometimes punishing rejection of him. On one occasion, Susan apparently tried to push Edmund in front of a train, and yet another time actually pushed him into the deep end of a swimming pool, where he almost drowned. The most common campaign of denigration is organized against ex-spouses and ex-partners of the borderline witch. Divorces, separations, and endings of relationships can trigger a full-blown war. Thus, custody battles may continue for years. The witch is consumed with annihilatory rage and may seek financial, emotional, and physical revenge. After her husband asked for a divorce, a patient blurted out, I want to hurt him as badly as he hurt me. I want him destroyed. Stirs up conflict and controversy in groups. The divide and conquer strategy is an attempt by the borderline to control others by splitting groups into factions. Individuals may be unaware that they have heard different versions of the same story and may turn against one another rather than confront or question the witch. Christina Crawford explained that her mother attempted to deceive the nuns who ran the boarding school Christina attended. Letters she received from her mother were written to present their relationship as warm and loving because her mother knew that the nuns read mail. Christina's actual conversations with her mother, however, were laced with hostility. Later, Christina discovered that her mother called the boarding school weekly, hoping to be told that Christina had been misbehaving. The borderline witch's ability to enlist others as allies disrupts and divides groups. When hospitalized, borderlines frequently split and project different parts of themselves onto various staff members, causing conflict among the staff. Adler found, Staff members who are the recipients of cruel, punishing parts of the patient will tend to react to the patient in a cruel, sadistic, and punishing manner. Staff members who have received loving, idealized, projected parts of the patient will tend to respond to him with a protective, parental love. Obviously, a clash can occur between these two groups of staff members. These mechanisms also help to explain why different staff members may see the same patient in very different ways. The destructive dynamic can have devastating consequences. Family members, including children, may be estranged or blacklisted for years, never knowing what went wrong. Robert Lincoln's mother refused to communicate with him for four years following her insanity trial. Hostility masks her fear. The borderline witch is terrified of vulnerability, of trusting, of not having control, of being helpless, of being hurt. Adler explains that the diffuse primitive rage of the borderline is an unchanneled, generalized discharge of hate and aggression. He believes that the borderline separation anxiety becomes annihilation panic. 
In other words, when the witch mother perceives her children as resisting her control by expressing their own will, she perceives them as threatening her survival. Her mindset is, if you are not with me, you're against me. The witch mother's hostility is an attempt to discredit those with power. Portraying the enemy as weak, incompetent, or worthless reduces the threat to her. Thus, she is pleased when others feel diminished, vulnerable, and powerless. The witch's children sense her pleasure, sadistic enjoyment, at their expense. In fact, degrading others does make the witch mother feel better. What must be understood, and what is so frequently overlooked by those who interact with the witch, is the intensity of her fear that drives her hostile behavior. She is so effective in projecting fear onto others that even experienced clinicians may fail to recognize her fear. Is intrusive, domineering, and violates the boundaries of others. The witch mother may violate every aspect of her child. She may be sexually abusive or sexually degrade her children. She may subject them to unnecessary medical procedures and humiliate them in public. She does not recognize appropriate boundaries and exploits the child's trust. She may search through their personal belongings, ask intrusive questions, and deny them their right to privacy. The witch mother has an almost uncanny ability to perceive vulnerability in others. She watches for indications of fear, shame, or guilt, and intentionally elicits such feelings in order to control her children. Children with witch mothers learn to hide their feelings and everything they love in order to survive. Christina Crawford described feeling as though her mother could read the secret vulnerabilities of her soul. Edmund Kemper complained that his mother invaded every aspect of his life. She felt entitled to control every decision, from the smallest detail to the major decisions of his life. After he murdered his grandparents, Edmund was confused and disoriented, unable to think for himself. Predictably, he turned to his mother for advice. At the time, he was unaware of the connection between his hatred of her and the reason he murdered his grandparents. Destroys valued objects or is intentionally withholding. Linehan reports that border lines in her clinic have broken clocks, torn bulletin boards apart, stolen mail, thrown objects, and written graffiti on walls. The witch destroys what is loved or valued. Witch mothers may intentionally withhold what their children need or want, including medical treatment. When the child is physically injured, such a mother may fail to seek appropriate medical treatment, even if the child is near death. Patients report having had favorite toys either broken or given away as punishment, and several had pets that suddenly disappeared. Henry Lee Lucas's mother shot and killed his pet mule after he told her that he loved it. One patient cried as she recalled that her mother set her pet rabbit loose following an argument. Joan Crawford cut up one of Christina's favorite dresses and made her wear it in shreds. Christina's mother believed in the convoluted philosophy that taking away what a child loves teaches the child how to give. Other patients lamented that their witch mothers intentionally withheld what they knew they loved or wanted, one patient explained that her mother gave her applesauce for dinner while she served the rest of the family's spaghetti, the patient's favorite meal. Naturally, the witch's children learn not to reveal what they love or want. The witch mother honestly believes, however, that what she is doing is for her children's own good. She simply repeats what she learned as a child. Possesses the conviction of being evil. Some borderlines feel as though they are possessed by the devil. The borderline witch may feel, look, and act possessed. She survived her childhood by fighting and continues the battle as an adult. Children of borderline witches are clearly at risk for becoming borderline themselves. For them, survival depends on their ability to become invisible or continue a never-ending battle. The witch's children may suffer from acute anxiety or murderous rage for the rest of their lives. Gunderson suggests that latent convictions of innate badness may become overwhelming to some borderline patients. 
Kroll observes that some borderlines feel both deserving of special consideration and simultaneously so evil as scarcely to deserve being alive. This sense of evil contributes to the witch's expectation of punishment from others. Some borderline witches may adhere to rigid religious practices in the attempt to seek redemption. As Daniel Paul observes, when a person negates his will and needs in the service of becoming invisible, the self is experienced as being claimed by a sinister aspect of the self or other. This sinister force becomes personified as an omnipresent demon, the devil. David Smith's statement that there was no doubt of something truly evil in Susan's character, something unspeakable, is the terrible truth about how borderline witches feel about themselves. Naturally, their children sense the presence of this evil force. The witch's child knows the unbearable truth about what lies within the mother's heart. Has a fear of entrapment. The witch will not tolerate being controlled by others. If she is hospitalized or restrained, she can unleash potentially destructive rage. She will lash out at others in order to escape, or will find a way of controlling the situation by stirring up conflict. Kroll relates an experience with a borderline witch. A 27-year-old divorced woman brought her three-year-old son to the hospital, where he was admitted with a diagnosis of pneumonia. Upon full examination, there was a suspicion of child abuse and neglect. The next day, the woman's request that she take her son home was refused by the hospital staff. She became very upset and verbally abusive and was escorted from the pediatrics ward. Several hours later in the evening, she returned and tried to remove her son from the ward. She was discovered and a struggle ensued. Hospital security was called. She ended up in four-point restraints after she kicked a security officer in the groin. I arrived and introduced myself and said that we might discuss her present predicament. She told me to have intercourse with myself. The patient successfully manipulated Crawl into releasing her from restraints and subsequently ran out of the hospital, cursing him. The tragic irony is that the witch's combative resistance to being controlled invites the use of increasing control, restraint, and restriction. After Diane Downs escaped from the Oregon State Penitentiary in July of 1987 and was subsequently recaptured, she was transferred to a maximum security prison in New Jersey. The will of the witch, however, may be stronger than any institution. Has a poor prognosis for treatment. Kernberg believes that borderlines who were raised by sadistic caregivers have the least chance of being successfully treated. In fact, borderline witches denigrate mental health professionals. The witch's lack of trust in others and the tendency to misperceive interactions as aggressive make it nearly impossible to help them. They can be so effective in provoking others that a battle for survival can easily ensue. Often, borderline witches will hurt themselves before allowing anyone to help them. As Joan Crawford lay dying, she refused to allow friends and family members to visit. Prior to her death, she had been losing weight for a year and was no longer capable of bathing herself. Nevertheless, she refused medical treatment. Only a woman employed by Mrs. Crawford was present at her deathbed. Christina later learned, The woman, realizing there was nothing more she could do, began praying for Mother. At first the prayers were silent, but as she realized how close the end really was, her prayers became audible. She was praying aloud, and Mother heard the words. Mother raised her hand. The last words from her mouth were, Damn it! Don't you dare ask God to help. A few minutes later, she was dead. The borderline witch may never relinquish control. The witch's motto, life is war. The witch's childhood experiences taught her that life is a battle for survival. She prepares her children for life as she knows it, for life in a concentration camp, for hating, fighting, and killing. Her children may learn not to fear danger. In fact, they may learn to seek it. They may enjoy having control over others, sensing vulnerability and exploiting it. 
They grow up broken, unable to love, unable to trust, unable to feel. The witch's children are victims of soul murder and may feel alive only when suffering or when inflicting suffering. The witch's messages to her children. I could kill you. You'll be sorry. You won't get away with this. You deserve to suffer. I'd be better off without you. You'll never escape my control. It's my right as your parent to control you. I'm going to make you pay. The witch's child is raised in a hopeless situation. The witch's need for control and dominance leaves the child filled with rage, fear, and self-hatred. Her words can be vile, her heart cold as stone. One patient, Amy, survived the terror of her childhood by developing an unshakable faith in God. Although she was left with permanent disabilities due to her mother's abuse, she was a loving wife and mother and a highly respected employee. Her faith in God and her belief that she was loved saved her soul from her mother's destructiveness. No one would believe what she endured as a child or the strength of mind that saved her. The witch's children survive their childhood by learning not to feel, cry, laugh, smile, or frown in their mother's presence. Adult children raised by witch mothers survived an emotional hell. Without intervention, young children may not survive.